espacio, Nagan. Gohin, Dauton, Talak, Janelle, Dalek, Ayesh, Gaina, Digagi, Gaelge, Michael, Sarah, Dundon, Agilis, Jagesai, Francis Polson, Dudon, Jihad Sadid, Slyko, Utasa. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Nagel. I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation. I live in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I grew up in Joplin, Missouri. Um, my parents are Michael Nagel and Sarah Thompson, and my grandmother is Frances Polson, who grew up near Jay, Oklahoma. Um, I am a journalist. And my uh, work continue, usually is at the intersection of um, Native representation and mainstream media and policies and court cases that impact Indigenous rights. And if you want to check it out, um, I have written and reported and hosted two seasons of a podcast called This Land. The first season is about a Supreme Court case that impacted the reservation status of um, five tribes here in eastern Oklahoma, including mine. Um, and the second season is about an attack on a law called the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, so if you want to, please check that out. Um, so today we are going to be talking about tribal sovereignty. But before we get into that, I really want to frame it with what are um, mainstream understandings about tribal sovereignty among the U.S. public and where does that come from. Um, and so to start off with, um, I'm going to share this image. So this is a screen grab of CNN's coverage of election night in November 2020. And it's exit polls that they gathered in the state of Arizona. And you can see they're categorizing the exit polls by race. But instead of listing native voters in the state of Arizona, they put a line that said something else <laughs> and categorize us as something else. Um, this uh, problematic categorization from CNN um, spurred a lot of really funny moments on social media. And so we got the meme, um, Tim McGraw's something else outlaw. We also got the meme, something else in the cupboard. Um, it's like pretty hilarious uh, few days on um, Facebook and Twitter for native folks, but it isn't a laughing matter. Uh, the mistake that CNN made is really serious because what it did is that it erased native voters in the state that had a lot of political power and actually swung Arizona for Biden um, on a night where a lot of national attention was about the outcome in Arizona. And so um, these two maps um, show that political power of um, native voters in the state. So the map on the left is the outcome um, by precinct of the presidential election in Arizona. And the map on the right are tribal lands in the state. And you can see that those blue areas are basically um, Phoenix and tribal land. And so, you know, on some reservations within Arizona, um, 95 to 98% of the vote went for Biden. And so that important political power, um, was, un was erased by CNN's coverage. Um, CNN is obviously not the only outlet that does this. Um, this is an article from the New York times, um, that came out in July of 2020 when people were talking about racial disparities with who was being impacted by COVID and um, also COVID-19 deaths. And they called, you know, the title of the article is the fullest look yet at racial inequity in coronavirus. But you'll notice from the categories of race that they analyze, Native American people weren't really included. Um, this is despite that COVID-19 had a really high disproportionate impact in Native communities um, that reflect uh, federal policies that really need to shift. And so um, one report from the Washington Post found that while one in 1,300 white people in the United States had died of COVID, um, one in 240 Native Americans had died. And so that's a huge um, disparity. Um, and so this is not just um, 
CNN or the New York Times. It's something that's actually pervasive in our culture. When you turn on the television, when you listen to the radio, when you tune into Netflix, less than one tenth of 1% of the people that you will see and hear will be Native American. Um, there's a really great sociologist and researcher named uh, Dr. Stephanie Freiberg. She's to Layla, who's put some real numbers to this. So she did a study that looked at the over 3,000 uh, television characters on the most popular TV shows in two decades from the mid 1980s to the mid 2000s. And she counted how many of them were Native American. And the grand total out of over 3,000 TV characters was just three Native characters. What her research also shows is that while we are most often not represented at all, when we are represented, it's not contemporary, living, breathing, real Native people. It's always this historicized and romanticized past. So another one of her um, studies, which she did in 2015, is she looked at the first 100 Google image search results for American Indian and Native American and found that 95% of the results, so 95 out of 100, were photographs from the past, not the present. So it's not just the American public that struggles to know, you know, what tribes are, what federally recognized tribes are, what tribal sovereignty is, what indigenous rights are, what contemporary indigenous people truly are. It's also the leaders of our country. And so to demonstrate that, I'm going to share this video um, of George W. Bush. Good morning. My name is Mark Trahant. I'm the editorial page editor of the Seattle Post Intelligencer and a member of the Native American Journalists Association. <laughs> Most school kids learn about government in the context of city, county, state, and federal. And of course, tribal governments are not part of that at all. Mr. President, you've been a governor and a president, so you have a unique experience looking at it from two directions. What do you think? tribal sovereignty means in the, tri in the 21st century, and how do we resolve conflicts between tribes and the federal and state governments? Yeah. Uh, tribal sovereignty means that. It's sovereign. I mean, it's, you, you're a, you're a, you've been given sovereignty and you're viewed as a sovereign entity. Okay. And therefore, the relationship between the federal government and tribes is one between sovereign entities. Oops. So we can laugh at George W. Bush, but how many of you um, can explain what a federally recognized tribe is? How many can you name three federally recognized tribe? You know, in the categories of Navajo and Cherokee aren't a federally recognized tribe, you know, Cherokee Nation or Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians or the United Ketua Band, those are the names of federally recognized tribes. How many folks on here know what the Indian Reorganization Act did or what the policy of land allotment was? Or how many of you can name any federal law that has impacted tribes in the United States? How many folks know what the Oliphant Supreme Court decision was? or could name any important court decision in the history of the United States that impacted Native rights. And so the type of ignorance that, you know, we can laugh at in that uh, Bush video is actually pervasive among American citizens. Um, so this is the Google predictive search of results for do Native. So it's like what people Google most often, and it's do Native Americans pay taxes? Yes, we do. Do Native Americans get free money? No, we don't. And do we celebrate Thanksgiving? Um, and so I believe strongly as, um, as a journalist um, that the stories that we tell ourselves um, about who we are as a country, where we come from, really impact laws and policy that in turn impact people's lives. And so that's why it's important for people to understand what tribal sovereignty is, because as long as we have a public and a voting citizenry that doesn't know what tribal sovereignty is, it means that our congressional representatives, 
um, our federal judges, you know, the people that we elect and put into power aren't going to be asked or expected to know what tribal sovereignty is anyways. You know, I mean, one of the last big um, court cases that went to the Supreme Court is called Adoptive Couple v. Baby Girl. And in it, there's a section where um, the Supreme Court justices, sitting Supreme Court justices, debate what constitutes a federally recognized tribe. You know, these are the people who have the power to determine what rights our tribes have, and they don't even understand legally what it is. Um, so let's get into it. What is tribal sovereignty? So I think the most important thing to remember about tribal sovereignty is that it is not something that is given to tribes, it is inherent. Our native nations uh, predate the creation of the United States. And while um, US colonialism and US law has obviously dramatically impacted um, our rights to self-determination um, and to self-governance and to things like our land and our culture and our water and our resources, um, even though those, those rights have been impacted, they are inherent. So they're not something that is given to Native nations by the United States. They are something that we have had, we, we automatically have because we have existed as Native nations since time immemorial. Um, and the bedrock of the legal relationship between the U.S. federal government and Native nations is the over 300 treaties that the U.S. federal government has signed with Native nations through the exact same constitutional process that the U.S. has signed treaties with Japan or Germany or other foreign governments. And so while we're in a tricky place where, you know, we've been defined as domestic dependent nations and we have a trust relationship to the United States, the, the bedrock of that is the treaty clause of the U.S. Constitution and that nation to nation relationship between the U.S. federal government and our native nations. And so just... Um, I think one of the other really important concepts when it comes to tribal sovereignty is that we um, are a political group and that's how our rights function and that's how the law works. So just like I have certain rights because I live in Oklahoma or I live in Cherokee County or I'm a citizen of the United States and all that impacts what local and federal laws apply to me and which ones don't because I am a citizen of Cherokee Nation, um, certain laws apply to me and through my the government of my tribe and that government's relationship to the US, certain laws flow to me. And so it's the same thing as we would think about with any other country or any other um, system of government. And it's really important thing um, for people to understand. Um, and I think one thing too, that is really misunderstood is that people, you know, just like those <laughs> Google <laughs> search results or the Google image search results, people have very, very outdated ideas about what tribal governments look like. Um, so many of our tribal governments look very similar to um, state or federal governments. You know, um, our tribal governments have our own laws. We have our own citizens. We have our own constitutions. We have our own court systems, our lands, police forces, um, healthcare systems. In a lot of places, you know, I can say as somebody who lives um, in eastern Oklahoma, um, in, in rural Oklahoma, a lot of the um, governmental infrastructure, whether it's paving a road or paying for a school to get a new basketball court or providing health care in a rural area is done here locally by the tribal governments. And so just like we would understand um, the difference between a city and a county and a state and the federal government and how all those layers of government work together. And in the education system in the United States, we teach that as kind of a civic lesson and a basic thing that we want, you know, the citizens of our democracy to understand tribal governments 
are an important layer of government when it comes to, you know, healthcare, roads, safety, environmental protection, that people need to understand how that layer of government fits into the broader picture of the United States. We have a nation to nation relationship with the US federal government that has been affirmed by the over 370 treaties that the US has signed with um, native nations. And while often those treaties aren't still <laughs> followed and we still have to advocate for those treaties to be followed, they're still the law of the land. And so a lot of times people think that, um, you know, just like that, you know, search result thing where, you know, the question was, do Native Americans get free money? You know, people think that um, tribes get, you know, quote unquote, special treatment. Um, but a lot of that special treatment is actually flows from our treaties. And so in exchange for billions of acres of land, the US federal government made certain promises to indigenous nations. And so sometimes um, in those treaties, it's, you know, the rights to hunt and fish in certain places. Sometimes it's the right to health care or education. And so those programs, um, whether it be IHS um, or the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, those programs aren't free handouts to Native people and tribes. They're in exchange for the land that the U.S. grew and gained a lot of wealth by. Um, and so we have had, um, if you look at uh, court decisions and uh, Supreme Court cases in the past 50 years, we've had some really, really big setbacks to Native rights. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of progress in Congress, um, which is exciting. And I just want to talk about one of those examples, um, which is the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act in 2013. Um, and actually the most recent one in 2022, which actually goes into effect um, this month in October. And so because of a Supreme Court decision in 1978, tribes actually do not have jurisdiction to prosecute non-Native people who commit crimes on their land against their citizens. So if you are not a citizen of a federally recognized tribe, you can go on to tribal land and you can speed, you can steal a pack of gum, you can murder somebody, and the tribe is prohibited from prosecuting you. What has come from that has been a crisis of violence um, in Indian country. And through that advocacy, really decades long advocacy um, of Native women and other tribal leaders, there's been a partial reversal um, where Congress has um, uh, impacted, uh, ha has partially rolled back the damage that Oliphant did. Um, <clears throat> and I think that what the research has shown is that where tribes can govern and be in charge of their own citizen safety, of our own land, that that increases safety for everyone. So a lot of the um, issues that we see in Indian country, what we advocate for as solutions to those problems is simply tribal sovereignty and the right to self-determination over our citizens and our land. Thank you so much for um, coming to this talk and um, listening to what I have to say. You know, I think when it comes to K through 12 education in the United States, we see a lot of the same problems with what's in the curriculum that are everything I talked about in my talk. So for example, um, when it comes to the boarding school era in the United States, only four states in the US teach boarding schools as part of the state standards curriculum. And in the other states, it's just completely left out. And so there are a lot of examples like that in um, K through 12 education where native people are also erased, especially post 1900. Oftentimes we just kind of fall off the map when it comes to history. Um, and so as educators, as people who are in the classroom, you know, you have the power or, um, to be an antidote to that, to change that and to change how you teach. So I just would really encourage you um, to do that and to be um, the educator from which your students can learn um, a more complete and a more true history of this country. So thank you again. So honored um, to talk to you all today. Really appreciate your time.